some amazing poets to the lineup if you didn't see that announcement go up. So, uh, without further ado, thanks for gathering with us. Uh, my name is Amanda Carreri. I'm an assistant professor here at the art department at UNM. Today we're partnering with Sanitary Tortilla Factory and Sherry Kreider. I'm going to give like a Ian hosting Mary, Enoch, Elizabeth Baxter, who has made time to share their practice with us. We also have the additional pleasure to welcome two poets uh, that will help us kick things off this evening, Manuel and Sarita Sol Gonzalez. Yeah. <laughs> after tonight's talk, please consider joining us for an after-talk gathering at Bow and Arrow Brewery with shared food from the Vidya Taco Truck. There'll be veg options also. And um, as we get started, I will offer a brief acknowledgement that we here at UNM are working on li and living on stolen ancestral lands of the Tiwa, Pueblo, Diné, and Apache people. peoples. Land acknowledgments as such are an invitation to join the long-standing collective efforts in relationship building, reparation, and repair. It's my honor to facilitate the Gale Memorial Lecture Series this year. This series was established in memory of Dr. David Gale and his wife Sylvia, whose generosity makes the series possible. It's also in partnership this year with the UNM Art Museum, the Tamron Institute, Sanitary Tortilla Factory, with additional contributions by the Painting and Drawing Department, Sculpture, and Eat Areas, Experimental Art and Technology Areas of the Art Department. All the lectures are free and open to the public. Um, we were able to start recording them on video too, so if you're interested in that, go to the UNM Art Department's YouTube channel to start to be able to see the rings up in the last time. Um, this year, the series is called FOA, Future Oriented Archives, to focus in on art's role in world building through the critical and creative act of study. In this context, archives serve as a conceptual and theoretical frame and a radical site of queer, feminist, and decolonial creative praxis. The series presents a range of engagements with archives, storytelling, and collective projects of futurity. A shout out to Jackie Lay, Meg Elcock, and Jeanette Peterson for their help with the series. And we have one last artist in the series, Carolyn Kent, next week, same time, same place, painter. Um, was just recognized as the Studio Museum uh, in Harlem's uh, Artist of the Year last year. So if that fits your interest, come on out. And that's in partnership with the Tamarind Institute also. One more PSA before we do bios is uh, we've got some flyers up here. If anybody in the house is a student, there's an open house student night at the museum tonight with refreshments and a dance party. So afterwards, head over there. And this is um, to, as they, uh, let's see. If you're a UNM student, consider heading over to the museum after the talk as they are relaunching their student advisory group. The project for students to get involved in the museum activities. All right, now give brief intros and we'll get started. Um, we'll probably, just so everybody knows what we're up to too, we'll probably have like 15 minutes with the poets and then about 45 minutes with Mary and a Q&A after. Loose time, just so we know what we're getting up to. Mary is an award-winning Philadelphia, now New York also, based multidisciplinary artist, activist, and educator who creates socially conscious music, film, and visual art through an autobiographical lens. Although it's been a decade since her release from a Pennsylvania prison, Mary's time spent on the inside continues to shape the direction of her art and practice. Her work offers a critical perspective on the particular challenges women of color face when they become immersed in the criminal justice system. Baxter's work has been exhibited at venues including MoMA PS1, African American Museum of Philadelphia, Freeze LA, Eastern State Penitentiary, Ben and Jerry's Factory in Waterbury, Vermont, Marcos Gallery, the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati. I've been living in Cincinnati recently. <laughs> um, Brown University, and I know a lot of people already know about this, but 
Mary has a big show up at the Brooklyn Museum right now. First solo museum show through August 13th, if you can get to see it this summer. All right, two more intros. Manuel Gonzalez, the city of Albuquerque Poet Laureate, uh, 2016 through 2018, began his career in Poetry Slam representing Albuquerque four times as a member of the Albuquerque Poetry Slam team. After working in Albuquerque's poetry community for six years, Manuel began to use slam poetry to help local youth find positive and constructive ways to deal with life's pressures. Manuel began teaching workshops on self-expression through poetry in high schools, youth detention centers, and community centers. He also started facilitating art therapy programs to help at-risk and incarcerated youth. In 2014, Manuel began collaborating with El Chante, Casa del Cultura's community space, to create Low Writing, that's the name of it, Low Writing at El Chante, a free bi-monthly writers group open to all members of the community. Manuel has appeared on the PBS show Colores, and he has recently received the 2021 New Mexico Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Committee Corazon de Cultura Art Honorary Award. Manuel has three collections of his poetry published, um, entitled, But My Friends Call Me Burke, Om Boy, O-M Boy, and Duende de Burke, Albuquerque Poems and Musings which was a finalist in the 2021 New Mexico Arizona Book Awards. Manuel currently teaches creative writing at Native American Community Academy, CNM, in Albuquerque. And last but not least, <laughs> right on, Sarita Sol Gonzalez is an 18-year-old performance poet from Albuquerque, currently finishing her final year of high school at the New Mexico School for the Arts in Santa Fe. Sarita has been published in various poetry anthologies and in 2016 published Burkinita, with Swimming with Elephants publications. Sarita was a featured speaker at Albuquerque's TED Talks Youth in 2015, and a featured performer at TED Talks Albuquerque main event in 2018. Uh, Sarita had the honor of being invited by U.S. Poet Laureate Juan Felipe Herrera to perform with him at the Library of Congress in D.C. And, um, She's also been awarded the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce 2016 President's Award for her accomplishments in poetry. Most recently, a 2018 Albuquerque Creative Bravos Award for using her, her poetry in community outreach. They currently manage and host WOC, Women of Color Open Mic, at El Chante. And that's a monthly poetry open mic and feature with priority on WOC voices. And give it up for Sarita. She'll be attending the UNM uh, in the fall. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's welcome Manuel and Sarita. Oh, I don't think we'll need a mic. I'm going to kind of fill in oh, the no, room with my please. voice. Oh, you want me to use the mic? It's captioning. Oh, Thank right. you, I appreciate it. That's okay. You know, um, I worked a lot in, in a lot of schools, and sometimes, like, there are kids that are with hearing disabilities and stuff, and I would have to be mic'd up. That's well, what one, one time I had to do that, and in the middle of my, like, performance, like, oh, I gotta use the bathroom. So I ran to the bathroom, and I forgot that I had the mic still on. And then, it was an embarrassing thing, and I just kind of, and, and I, I, I kind of, in love to embarrass him. <laughs> but, um, Mija, you go sit down and then I'm gonna call you back up here in a bit. We're gonna tell you guys a little bit about what we're here to do. Um, so, it, there's nothing more uncomfortable than to sit in an audience and listen to somebody read my bio, but I'm, I'm Albuquerque Poet Laureate, and I'm here to, to kind of share a little bit of poetry from Burke with you, because we're from here, and, and, and this place is so rich. We have what they say an embarrassment of riches when it comes to arte and poetry and self-expression and authenticity in that way. So I'm gonna start by telling you guys a story, you know, cause today is such a windy day and I think we're gonna have to summon the wind and talk about this elemental. What happened to me was I went down to the river, the bosque is the, is the forest around the river, you know, and, and that's where like I read and I, and I, I write poetry and do stuff there. 
One time it got so windy that, that I, I got mad and started to yell poetry into the wind. And then after I yelled, the, the wind died down and the sun came out and I wrote this poem. So check it out. It's time to begin. It's time to begin the story of the poet and the wind. Now the poet went to the river one day to sit and talk to the river and pray. The trees were happy to see him with their leaves red, brown, and gold because fall was falling fast and things were beginning to get cold. So the poet gave respect to the river, respect to the sky, and respect to the earth. The four directions and inner reflections as to why he was given his birth when all of a sudden the poet heard leaves rustling and he knew that it must have been the wind. And, and the wind always blew right through him so he packed up his things to go home. Now the wind was from the north, powerful and strong, and the breeze made the trees howl and sing the wind song, so the poet started stepping. But the wind gave chase, and it blew a gust and kicked up dust right up in the poet's face, and the poet... He wasn't going to stand for this disgrace. So the poet did the craziest thing you'd ever see. The poet battled the wind with poetry. And the wind got crazy and it started to gust. And the poet raised his head and he started to bust about earth pollution and mind evolution and how you can kill the revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. And just when it looked like the poet was winning, the wind began to gather and it started spinning and it knocked that poet blind because the wind is a warrior just as old as time. Came at that poet so hard that it blew the poet's mind. So we started reaching for metaphor and searching for simile digging deep inside himself for the capability of seeing beauty in everything. And his heart began bursting and blooming, and he spoke of love and life and his emotions inside. But then the wind came at him like an ocean tide, and it knocked that poet right off of his feet. But the poet, he wasn't that easily beat. He got right back up and started his expression, making each and every word a personal confession. The poet tried to find all the prose he could muster, but the wind was blowing hard and it started to bluster. And the poet got crazy and he raised his head and the poet started to reach for his words and speak from his heart and he raised his head and the poet started to feel it and then and go farther and further. <clears throat> but then the poet realized something. He didn't know what to do because he saw that the wind had died down too. See, neither of them was stronger than the other. Both of them warriors, both of them brothers. They had stood eye to eye, toe to toe, but they no longer look at the other as a foe and that's where the story must end, both having respect for their newfound friend, the wondrous tale of the poet and the wind. Thank you. Ooh. Now, I get the pleasure of introducing you to my favorite poet in, in all of the world, and, and she's my daughter, Sarita, and, and, and she's an amazing youth poet in the Albuquerque scene and is making things pop out there and she's doing good. Come and show them what you got me. Hello, my name is Sarita Sol Gonzalez. I'm 18 years old, born and raised here in Burke. Um, I'm just going to jump into my first piece. <laughs> The title of this piece is My Story Revised. Words bloom from my mouth like a, like a what? How do I use words to explain the tangle of meaning in my brain? Which adjective describes the story I tell myself? Which thesaurus has a synonym for emotion? Where do I find the words? When will language soar on my chest to rest on the minds of people who understand? I call out to who I used to be, afraid of who they were, but ready to grow, terrified of judgment, wanting to revise their body, wanting to revise their body, angry at the world and ready to step forward, ready to brandish my pen and write to myself and say, it's okay. 
Tell them everything happens for a reason To slow the spinning spiral circulating my senses To allow myself to breathe To move, to think You are worthy of love even when you feel you don't deserve it Pen, a tool I use to communicate with myself who I used to be, who I want to be, to talk to my ancestors for guidance and my dreams for wisdoms. I write what I see, I write what I hear around me. I write to thank you. Thank you for listening to me, for watching, for dedicating your mind to me, if only for a moment, for feeling with me. To thank myself for writing to ask my pen for forgiveness, to apologize to who I am and thank them for getting me this far. It is not over, the moment has only begun. It is time to step forward into the me of tomorrow. And together let's revise this poem. I call out to who I am, knowing who I was but ready to grow, terrified of judgment and wanting to revise my story. Empathetic towards the world and ready to step forward. Gracias. No. I saw that up there and I was going to get a drink. <laughs> All right. This one's about how life can be a dance. And this title may be La Loca, that means my crazy life. So this goes like this Mi vida loca. My crazy life, full of magic and mystery, this life we lead, this road we walk. Our shoes are tattered and torn, but still we dance. We dance to celebrate life, la vida. We dance our prayers into the soil, Mother Earth, Madre Tierra, as tears trickle down our cheeks. With passion and palmas, con gusto, our grito can be heard, crying out our pain until it turns to laughter. After that, we laugh at our own mortality. Muerte and marigolds litter the streets of the South Valley as we build altars to honor our ancestors who are with us here in spirit. Finding silence in secret, sacred places, places where the river tells her tales and cotton, it floats in the air like forgotten dreams, reminding us of our magic here in the moment, forever now. The, the, mist, the, the river sings and her melody is mesmerizing, making music that was composed at the beginning of time, at the magic hour, where the light is blue, where we are one, unmoving together in this melody and rhythm. We dance this dance, this vida, this life full of locotes, this beautiful nightmare where we all bleed red, where we all shed tears in secret. Together, we all cry alone, hiding the shame of our tears by avoiding eye contact, because our eyes got big mouths and they'll snitch on you for the price of a glance. Don't give them a chance and don't get dizzy, because spinning is part of the dance. Like a, like a Sufi, our spirals can spin inward and our suffering is a sacrifice, like the scars on a sun dancer's chest but we don't speak of the things that we take seriously and hold sacred, like santuario sand, or, or a sage smudge stick sitting on an altar next to pictures of people in need of prayer. Metakio asin, all our relations with gratitude. We give thanks for this life, this vida, this, this brief moment in time where our little light shines for less than a blink of an eye in the dream of time. We awaken to find lagañas in our eyes, reminding us to bring back the, the songs and stories from our dreams, the flowers and song, the flor y canto, the inshushi in siwa, our history our grandchildren's songs that we're learning to hum today. Today, we inherit the legacy of opportunity. Every morning, the sun rises and we get another chance to feel this rhythm and dance this dance, this vida, this, this moment where we keep the ballerinas on their toes in this intense tango of, of terror and delight, two-stepping with la muerte to the last song at the end of the night before the early bird begins to sing and the world becomes washed in that blue light before dawn, the delicate light of an infant day, where we get another opportunity, 
another moment to shine, another chance to dance. Thank you. This next piece um, is a persona poem um, about Frida Kahlo. The title of this piece is 1939. I remember the first time I saw you. It was in a jazz club in Paris, France. I wore a brown suit and suspenders to draw less attention. It took me just a bit too long to sit down my cane, just barely holding my weight. The pain was almost unbearable. As the room went dark, the pain faded away for once. You stood there in a banana skirt and no top, breathtaking. With a sway of your hips and a shine of your smile, you effortlessly enthralled the audience as you flowed and skipped across the stage. You puckered your lips, crossed your eyes, and pressed in your dimples to laugh with us. You look so joyful and free, a mix of childlike glee and undeniable beauty. And then you sang, soft enough to make me lean in. It was the bird song in the dead of night, breaking me out of this trance. Your voice was warm and sweet. And then you were gone. Just as swift as you had appeared, it felt like ages to snap me out of this daze. And once I did, I realized that I hadn't touched my tequila con lemon. I couldn't get you off of my mind. Your voice and movement felt like a gift made only for me. You emerged from the stage door, and all I wanted to do was talk to you. Your voice felt so much stronger when in conversation you asked me about my cane, my life, and who I truly was. And I finally understood our connection when you told me about your pain, your loss, about Harlem and why you danced. We make art for the same reasons, you and I. Pain, that driving force. But we use it in different ways. You smile and dance to deal with it. I cry and paint to express it. Your heart, glows with ho your heart glows with hope and with a cracked soul. You bleed light. I knew that I was talking with a fellow goddess. And we talked until sunrise. And as you left, all I could think to myself was, Josephine Baker y Frida Kahlo <laughs> just sound Right. Yeah. All right. We're gonna finish this with a little duet that we've been doing for a long time. Ooh. But um, those of us from Albuquerque don't always say Albuquerque. Some of us we like to say Burke. And so this is kind of a poem about that. And me and my hita have been doing this for we're doing for you like that. All right. With watermelon mountains melting misconceptions, misconceptions, with crazy local dreams and contemplative confessions, I watch cholos chasing chicas. They're leaving me vida loca like the Asian Mexica. With kickback khakis to camouflage clown faces, we smile now, we cry later. Watching breakdancing b boys battling the crossfader. My name is Albuquerque. But, but my, my friends, friends call me Burke, as my mother makes masa with flour and manteca, rolling out her tortillas and scraping her spices in a morcajete like the ancient Azteca, as Torteca knowledge is passed down from our grandfathers, and my mother lights a candle for La Virgen de Guadalupe. My name is Albuquerque, but my friends call me Burke, as the sands of the Santuario silently calls the sound for my soul, and the pain and perseverance of the penitentes plant the seed that will one day make me whole. And the legions of Mary who pray the rosary for humanity, who don't have enough time to bend their own knees. My name is Albuquerque, but my friends call me Burke. 
I'm listening to Saturday morning traditions played by musicians, the founding fathers of my self-image, those rancheras and cumbias and boleros sung with the teardrop on their vocal cords. Y por ver, por ver, por ver. My name is Albuquerque, but my friends call me Burke. And I'm looking at a three score and I'm thinking about land grants, wondering if our kids even have a chance as day turns to night and they begin to dance. You know, I was named after a duke who never left Spain and being junior without knowing your father brings a lot of pain. My name is Albuquerque. But my, but my friends, friends call me Burke. Thank you. documentary and um, in honor of the 50th anniversary of hip hop. I hope you enjoy.
son. Imagine being trapped in a bed, hurting your son, never nursing your son. Looking for a savior, but that person will come. Locked in the cell, seven twins, three and one. My chickens is dumb, I'm numb, cause getting money always been a rule of thumb. Flashback, I saw my time, mama busting out window. I seen a couple of hot girls, a lot of residential. This stomach's full of empty and robberies on the menu. So when they try to get you, tell them, nigga, plot to get it too.
entertainment. All of y'all are on the spot when they keep us medicated. Focus on celebrities, Xbox, entertainment. What hard smoke good? They say this is getting me from the American dream. But I'm from an ain't reciprocate. Only legalized visa court. I'm going to regulate it. It's a lot of y'all. The song is overly dedicated. Smoke the whole old and haze, but I should have meditated. Donald Trump administration was civil bush. Ronald Reagan still fighting for civil rights like we did back in segregation. So what? And on that black Messiah along the way, the strong black who gifted the woman. They ain't anticipated. Discipline. Dedicated. Real soldier decorated. That's the real reason if you wonder why I'm underrated.
So yeah, like I said before, um, I created this uh, musical documentary in 2018 as part of my uh, Right of Return fellowship that I won along with Sherry and about six others. And um, it was used, and it, it still is being used as a policy organizing tool for the Dignity for Incarcerated Women Act, which is legislation um, that bans the shackling of women, um, or it could be a caregiver um, who finds themselves incarcerated and pregnant. Um, it's still legal in almost uh, two dozen states. Um, in Philadelphia, it was banned in 2010, but what we got from folks on the inside um, was that it wasn't being enforced and women were still being shackled. So the film was also used um, to have focus groups uh, throughout the state of Pennsylvania uh, to speak with the community and get them to speak with legislators. And then we all came to the table and co-authored legislation that was introduced um, about a year ago and we're still waiting uh, for it to be voted on. So um, how did I get here? In 20, well, no, 2007, I was nine months pregnant. Uh, I was arrested and within three days, I went into labor. Um, while at the prison, I was transferred to a local hospital. Uh, and while there, I spent uh, about 43 hours uh, shackled to the hospital bed while I was in labor. Um, I want to say maybe three or four days later, uh, my son went home with his father and I stayed at the hospital because I had a major surgery. Uh, with the C-section, they cut your, your abdomen. I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar with the process. Um, so I had needed to stay a little bit longer because they do remove your organs during that process and they put things back just to make sure that everything was operating correctly. Um, so, but when I got back to the prison, I was placed in something called administrative segregation. Um, which is another word, fancy word for solitary confinement, but this is usually for people um, for their own protection. So someone that has been um, assaulted, has been raped, um, and in my case had a medical emergency where you know they were incapacitated um, to a degree, you would be placed there. So you go from one trauma to the next. Um, you can imagine um, the isolation that I felt, and it didn't help that the doctor was on vacation and he had to approve for me to leave. So um, I spent about a week in solitary confinement um, after having my son. And it wasn't until 2017 that I got this opportunity um, through Right of Return, which was a $20,000 um, fellowship that provided um, $10,000 for a project and $10,000 for an artist fee, um, that I had the resources to actually um, process what had happened. Um, I was released from prison seven months after my incarceration uh, and didn't get an opportunity, like I said, to really process and understand what had happened until I got this, this fellowship. And that gave me the time and space um, to really uh, dig deep and, and try to heal. So um, I made this film not only for myself, but also for my son. Um, you know, it's his story just as much as it is mine. And I didn't want um, our lowest moment to be, um, you know, what he, you know, would always come back to. So um, that's pretty much what, what happened with the film. And then I'll go through my PowerPoint. Uh, okay. So with my art, I'm pretty much always um, responding to the moment um, or personal experience or so, experience of someone that I know. Um, this is a shot from Eastern State Penitentiary. I shot Ain't I a Woman at Eastern State because of his, its historical significance. Um, I'm a lifelong Philadelphian and I was um, shocked when I learned that Philadelphia had the first um, true penitentiary and that the radio design that was um, created at Eastern State became the blueprint or template um, for pretty much all penitentiaries, where you have a small amount of people able to surveil a larger number um, of individuals. Also, what's interesting about Eastern State, um, they had women were housed there as well as over 900 children. Um, the women that were there um, were uh, 
housed in a, a section of the jail where they weren't permitted to use the hospital. That's another interesting thing about Eastern State. It had a full-fledged hospital. Even people from the outside could come in and get treated. Um, but what people don't understand is patriarchy and racism, all those things don't end because you go to prison. Um, you're st all those structures um, are still there. So um, unfortunately, women gave birth in their cells. So I thought it was um, just important to, to shoot it there because of that. Another thing in my practice, um, I usually uh, pull work from work. <laughs> so this is a still from Ain't I a Woman, which was used in a national billboard camp, um, campaign with Four Freedoms. I actually created two um, billboards with them. This one um, was in collaboration with a writer named Donna Hilton, uh, who does a lot of advocacy um, around abolition and raising awareness around sex trafficking um, of women who find themselves incarcerated. and. Um, I think I just really wanted to drive home that, uh, for me, the way that I see it, uh, mass incarceration is a reproductive justice issue for black people in America. Um, this is another uh, still from the film that was featured in Marking Time, um, traveling exhibition that has been, uh, yeah, traveling since uh, 21, September 2021 and we'll be traveling for the next three to five years. This is another work that's inside of the film. It's a painting that Russell Craig, um, who's, another, who's actually, so these two guys are actually the founders of Right of Return, the fellowship that me and Sherry um, won in 2017. And they made me the centerpiece of their mural that was featured on the Municipal Services Building across from City Hall in Philadelphia. And uh, in the third act, when I'm coming out of the building, I'm actually coming out of this, this piece that I'm featured in which um, for me was, was advocating for um, shared governance of formerly incarcerated people, um, not as tokens, but you know, at the table and leading the charge of uh, reform. This is what the um, work lived as for a few years. Eastern State, crusty halls. <laughs> so also, um, I am also, I consider myself an activist. Dignity Act Now Collective is uh, a collective that I co-founded and it um, contains, you know, uh, women, trans and non-binary folks. And uh, we, you know, help with bailouts uh, for caregivers or women identifying folks or non-binary folks. And we also help with political education. During the pandemic, very early on, we um, joined National Bellout to, oh, this is when we introduced uh, the dignity legislation. Oh, I'm trying to get there. All righty. Okay, so yeah, early on during the um, pandemic, we teamed up with National Bellout. Um, which is a national organization that around, it's built out of the philosophy of when enslaved people used to pull their money together to purchase each other's freedoms. So that's kind of started a grassroots um, campaign of black community and now it's like national, international, and every year they have specific bailouts for caregivers. So, you know, with so COVID-19, you can't social distance in the cell. We had to accelerate those bailouts. Um, we didn't get a chance to, to wait till Mother's Day and, you know, with the bailouts, we gave them um, care packages along with um, laptops and um, iPads so they can stay digitally connected, but then also take our political education classes and get um, and any other resources with uh, any of the other organizations we're connected with, like housing assistance, um, community legal service assistance, things like that. Okay, um, again, responding to the moment, uh, this was a mural that I did with Mural Arts Philadelphia, and it was right after um, the tape was released of George Floyd's murder. Um, and I wanted to do something that really catered to folks on the ground, um, you know, black people, but also our allies who were filling um, all of the fields with us and on the ground with us. Um, and yeah, so this was something that I, that I thought was important just to raise, um, you know, the momentum, but, but also let people know that we care. It also came with a set of demands. This is another campaign I did with Mural Arts looking at uh, racism as a national public health crisis. Uh, we did a couple of marches that summer of 2020. 
Um, community members even joined in. Uh, this is another campaign I did uh, with Mural Arts and AT&T, again, for um, folks on the ground, for allies that really want to see equity. And how do we get here? So in mining my work, um, uh, Ain't I a Woman, and looking at root causes of incarceration, I began to come up, um, well, find and, and dig into concepts around adultification bias, which is the hyper-criminalization, sexualization um, of black children. And the way that it shows up um, for black girls um, is that as young as five, they're thought to know more about sex, need less nurturing, protection, care. Um, and so how do we get here? I'm at work. I was working at Mural Arts Philadelphia. It's housed in the... Uh, home and home studio of Philadelphia's most famous artist, a guy named Tam Thomas Eakins. Y'all probably all heard of the Gross Clinic. Uh, but one thing you probably hadn't heard was he's a serial sexual predator. Um, so much so that he was forced into resignation by the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and disowned by his family for molesting his niece who killed herself with a family shotgun. While at work, um, around the same time I'm learning these things about Eakins, I'm also learning about Penn Museum and um, their um, participation in the desecration of the remains of the MOVE children. In 1985, there was a police bombing in Philadelphia where 63 homes were burnt to the ground. 11 people were killed, um, and five of them were children. Uh, two of the children's remains were sent to UPenn's anthropology department for um, identification, and some of them never returned. A curator uh, around this time called up a local activist in Philly and, and told them that the remains had been being used as a teaching device for 30 years, um, most recently in a course called Adventures in Anthropology. Uh, once that came out, the website that accompanied the course and all that was removed and the bones um, were given to a local funeral home without the family's consent. These were the children that were murdered. So I'm at work one day, and again, I'm digging into this work. And also, so I'm at Mural Arts, and did I say that it's the home office? And how's the time? So yeah, I'm at work, and this is the pandemic. People are working, 90% of the staff were working from home. As the office manager, I had to be there to answer phones and you know, let people in with packages and things like that. And um, I found that on the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts website, they had this image of one of Thomas Eakin's photos, which was used in a book um, by a woman named Sadia Hartman. She teaches at Columbia University, MacArthur Fellow Genius Award winner. Uh, she wrote a book called Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. And it was all about her engagement this was, it was the impetus for her writing this book was her engagement with this photo in the archive of this young prepubescent girl posed as the Alalis, um, completely nude. So after I read this, this article in the New Yorker, which was an excerpt of the first chapter detailing um, the girl's um, story, I went on the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and uh, typed in the name of the photo and it was there for download. Um, after I downloaded the photos, I felt that I needed to do some critical care and redress and reimagine these moments safe and protected as they should have been. So I photoshopped myself in and covered her, um, her body. This work is also in conversation with Harvard University. I don't know if you've heard about the slave daguerreotypes. Anybody? <laughs> so there was a gentleman by the name of Louis Agassiz. Is that it? Anybody know? <laughs> he, um, and it's in my research, I recently found out that um, Louis was actually connected with Harvard um, by Samuel Morton. So the Morton collection is, is actually what prompted, so the day that Penn uh, announced that they were going to repatriate the skulls of the Morton collection, which were unethically amassed skulls to prove scientific racism. Um, that night they called and said they had the bones of the MOVE children. Um, so all of this is like snowballing at the same time. And um, I was thinking about the materiality of the daguerreotype and its toxicity. A lot of women and girls that handled these photographs died. Um, and I was thinking about that, you know, that materiality being a uh, metaphor for the way that Eakins had weaponized his lens on the girl. 
But in photography in general, since its inception, was used um, to you know, uh, dissuade people from abolition and um, encourage the continued subjugation of uh, black people and brown and indigenous people in this country. Um, but I also was thinking about um, the inability for children to have language, and I wanted to keep them small, and the ability to open and close became very um, critical there. Uh, and then I guess lastly I'll say I'm thinking about Afrofuturism and the fact that we can't um, you know, use time travel and things like that to take ownership over these narratives. Uh, after I completed the art, I reached out to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts um, to you know, ask for their support and um, you know, uh, encouraging them to make a public statement because after they had saw that I made this artwork, they decided to remove the photographs from online access, which was great. But I told them that they couldn't do it um, that way. It couldn't be in darkness because childish, childhood sexual abuse or any sexual abuse for that matter is shrouded in darkness, secrecy, and shame. And I felt that it was, um, you know, a, a disservice to the young girl and her story, but then also it was a slap in the face to my activism. After I did the op-ed, Mural Arts Philadelphia released a statement and said that they would no longer use Thomas Eakins' names on, on their business cards or promotional materials, because generally that's what they would use to promote um, uh, any of their programming. Um, and then the Pennsylvania Can Academy of Fine Arts uh, took it a step further and co-opted my artist statement, further, um, <laughs> furthering the violence. Um, they never denounced Eakin's predatory legacy and never apologized, if you read this statement. It's just my artist statement. Uh, so after that, I did an online campaign where I had, and it's still going on, it's still ongoing, so if you guys want to sign the petition, which um, uh, a few notable folks have signed on, but, you know, uh, pretty much asking for repatriation of the photos, of public apology, significant investment in the arts and culture development of black girls in the city of Philadelphia, as well as a fuller account of Eakin's um, history uh, you know, at the academy, I felt like they have a duty to some scholarship around that. Uh, the art newspaper picked it up. Um, they said that they were, in, within that article, that they were going to have robust programming to address the wider community. In fact, what they did was take um, some of the language that the organizers at the, um, that were outraged around the Move Children's Remains at UPenn, they used some of that. And then they used my op-ed and my art as teaching tools and didn't invite me. With an event called the Ethics of the Archives, um, their responsibility to live community. So I don't know who those people are. And then last but not least, this is the second billboard that I did with Four Freedoms. Um, this was a billboard I did by myself. And again, it's um, in the same vein of tackling adultification bias and raising awareness around that. And that's it. Any questions? <laughs> and this work um, is, is in my exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum as well. If you haven't been to the series, we just have an imaginary mic and just raise your voice, <laughs> throw your hands up, take up the space, and get into conversation. <laughs> See, we should have asked the Q&A after the film. Now y'all like, I don't know what to ask. We got one right back there, yeah. Uh, speaking of the film, for you, what is the intersection of presumed reform and white fragility? Say that again? What is the intersection of prison reform and white fragility? Um, prison reform and, I mean, Prison, <laughs> I mean, let's just look at what prisons are. Prisons are an extension of slavery. Um, pr prisons are also a business. Slavery was a business. Um, I don't think people are fragile. I think people are cold-blooded and they don't care. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the privatization of prisons across the nation? I mean, they've been doing that. <laughs> 
that's always been a thing. I mean, right after slavery, with the chain gangs and locking people up for loitering or just, you know, not having a job, um, three or more gathered on the corner. Uh, I mean, the black coats. Yeah. What was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do you think we can expand our uh, understanding of history, like purely all of these issues like are like seem like they're trending now, but you know, expanding that the long view and connecting it to slavery, like I mean what, what's the best way to get there? Or I mean it's probably a multi. I mean, for me, what I've come to understand is racism fulfills a psychological need at this point. And people don't want to give it up. Because as long as they can feel better than any black person, no matter how shitty their life is, you know, it serves that purpose. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the do-gooders, the liberals, it fulfills a need for them. They get to be special. They get to help. They get to, you know, I mean, it's right. It's, it's interesting. I mean, that's just my opinion. <laughs> uh, the mic. First, oh, I'm just so Jerry. You're just thank you so much. Thank you for um, everything you've done for um, taking your story and amplifying other people's voices. Uh, that reminder that the those closest to the problem are closest to the solution, and UNM's right on central. So that's a great reminder for us. But. Um, what I've found in academic institutions is this idea that everything can become academicized. Oh, yeah, they will intellectualize you to death, and you'll never solve the problem. They just want to, I mean, think about art, fine art. They just want to look at it, you know what I mean? They want to think about it. They don't really want to do anything about it. It's entertainment, almost, to an extent. No, absolutely, and it's so weird. Um, like, we were just reading Audre Lorde's uh, Poetry is Not a... A luxury. Oh. oh, I love it. Yeah. I gotta bring, I gotta, matter of fact, I gotta get your information. I have a friend named Lyrispect um, from I Philly. Mean, no. They did a, they did a, 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 poetry is not a luxury. They did a, a remake of it so far. I'm gonna so get it to you. A line that says, for women, poetry is not a luxury. Mm -hmm. But often, in more than one class, I've been in where people read that line and they're like, what Lord means is, for everyone, poetry is not a luxury. And um, in these classes, there's, there's never been a black woman to, to speak up. Right. Um, and I was just wondering, just if you may <laughs> remind us, you know, speak to why is it important to not take these... Really, take up space? Take up space, but to take these lines and say like, oh, no, no. It's so generalized. This word means something for me too. It's like, no, it means well, something that's very so Toni Morrison said it perfectly. It's from being at the center, you know, yeah. and always being at the center. They don't see anything outside. I mean, this country conditions, conditions folks to think that, you know, they're the best thing since sliced bread and no one else matters. Um, so they're always at the center of the story. So when they're not at the center, it's kind of hard. Hmm. Because you've always been at the center. It's hard to distance yourself. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's just my opinion. I hope I have the bravery someday to say thank you. Yes? Um, in regards to your work with the uh, photographs, mm -hmm. have any of the descendants of the children reached out to you? or? So we don't know who she is. She, her, she's unnamed, the girl in the archive. But what's interesting is um, in 1882, when this photograph was taken um, of the girl, one of the only two cemeteries in Philadelphia, black cemeteries, were being robbed of the bodies by Thomas Jefferson Medical College. Um, and guess who was over there all the time? Eakins. He was best friends with one of the lead conspirators, Dr. Forbes, um, who also co-wrote the Gasly Act, which gave him like more access to bodies. So if you died in a prison or insane asylum or a poor house, um, the alms house, they could just take your body. So with Morton, he would do this. They would just chop your head off at the table. And some of these people never got burials. So it gets kind of dark. Like, did she ever make it out the house? Because 
When that happened, when the scandal happened with the bodies, the reporters waited, I think, about a year, where they investigated the medical college, seen them bringing the bodies in and out, even went to the cemetery, followed them, and they did a citizen, this was when they did citizen's arrest reporters. Um, and the black community was in an uproar. They were like at the precinct, throwing things. So I don't see like this little girl coming home like, yeah, guess what I did today? Um, yeah, we don't know who she is, which is unfortunate. Um, yeah. I hate to get so sinister, but. Yeah? Um, I was wondering, so, I mean, for your video kind of documentary, and like you're, you're getting really personal, but also you're kind of processing this after like a while? Years. years. Let me see. Um, so, 2000 is 10 years. It was a decade, about a decade. And uh, yeah, I guess like. I'm wondering about like the, you're you're like experiencing like a really intense thing, and also you're trying to give a voice to other people that are. So on that. one end is cathartic, on the other end is super traumatizing. Right. Re-traumatizing. That's, yes. That was, that's kind of like my question. Like, how how are you like working through it in a way where it's like you're able to share these things, but like like without. You know, like how, and, and, then, and now it's like, and you're kind of like campaigning too, like the fight isn't stopping. You know? Right. Like, yeah. You know, um, take care of yourself. So I try to, you know, do a little meditation here and there. Um, I do music, well, I guess it's a, well, I mean, I do music just for fun too. <laughs> um, that's not really attached to an outcome or a trauma, um, just to, you know, have fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I'm still trying to find different ways I mean, because it is hard. It's hard. It's not easy. I make it look easy, but <laughs> it's not. Uh, with, uh, with rap and hip hop being one of the most influential like, forms of communi communication, communication in the world right now, like, what, what, are the, uh, what are the roots of the first time you heard rap or hip hop? As a child. Probably was like, um, what did I used to listen to? I mean, since I can remember, it, it's been hip hop. So some of my earlier influence, I would say, would be MC Light, Queen Latifah, um, Kooji Rat, Rakim, um, Lauren Hill, Nas, um, Kendrick Lamar. I like, I like his stuff, some of his stuff. Um, it's kind of hard though right now, right? Because rap is so powerful, but it's being used to sell products. Um, and then also misogyny and patriarchy. I mean, like, right? So um, for me, hip hop at this stage is like white people funding black dysfunction. Because there are plenty of Lauryn Hills out there. There are plenty of, I mean, you see my, I'm a nice, I feel like I got skills, right? <laughs> Nobody want to pay me no mind, though. I mean, like, in corporate, you know what I mean? Like, this is not what's being pushed to the masses. This is a bunch of ignorance, violence, um, and just hypersexuality. Yeah. yeah. But it is a powerful tool. Yeah. Um, in Anna and a Woman, I noticed there was a large community engagement involved. Um, could you say more about the people from your community and your neighborhood? that you brought into this project? Yeah, so um, in the first two acts are um, family members and friends. Um, and one of the, the scenes where we stop and we talk, um, those are, I think in all those scenes, those are, those are friends from the, from the neighborhood. Um, and the last act was a press conference for the mural. So, the world is your stage. I had all my actors. It was perfect. <laughs> I think we got time for one more over there. Um, yeah, I was curious about um, after your experience with the Philadelphia Art Museum and the Brooklyn Museum, like how, how do you think about working with institutions uh, in general? I mean, they're the biggest problem, right? I mean, let's look at what museums were founded for. They were founded to parade colonial conquests, right? These are the trophies of the conquered people. It's founded on blood and bones. I mean, I don't think you can decolonize the museum. It's nice, it sounds nice, it sounds cool.
Just like I don't think that you can buy like Juneteenth ice cream and you're supporting black people all of a sudden. Like, come on, it's ridiculous. All right, well, this was fun. <laughs>